Hey everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm really excited to have with me, from Little Caesar, Ron Young. Ron will share with us stories about recording their debut album with Bob Rock. He has some great stories about touring with Kiss, as well as why Arsenio Hall got mad at the band. He'll also talk to me about getting a role in Terminator 2, and how his band ended up having the name of a major national pizza chain. It's a really funny story. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well. Now, without further ado, let's jump in and get started with my conversation with Little Caesars' Ron Young. So, yeah, so I guess let's just start there then, you know, so how and when did the band Little Caesars get started? Well, we formed in, let's see, I met all, started meeting all the guys in like 87, 88. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time in L.A., everybody was dressed like chicks with their hair 20 <laughs> feet high, wearing high heel shoes and that. You know, I was a Harley guy, and I'm like, man, I'm never going to be able to do this. So <laughs> I found some other like-minded dirt bags, you know, <laughs> and we wanted to be more blues and soul-based than the pop-based kind of stuff that was coming out. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was working the door at a couple of clubs in L.A., so I was always meeting a whole bunch of guys. You know, I just moved from New York in like 86 so i wasn't here that long mm -hmm. so yeah we just started getting together and jamming on some like r&b and blues and soul covers and stuff and you know because i was working the door at a lot of these clubs getting gigs was no problem and sure. you know got some good slots and because we were all you know motorcycle riding guys we had a whole bunch of buddies and so mm -hmm. we packed the places out and mm -hmm. Within like three shows, I got like Jimmy Iveen, you know, the big music mm -hmm. guy coming down, checking us out. And, you know, he wanted to represent us. And it wasn't too long after that that all these record labels were jumping at us. So mm -hmm. it was it was great, man. We were really lucky and really excited. Absolutely. And then ultimately, you guys signed with Geffen, right? Around 1989 yeah. time period. So what was yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we signed in like late 88. And then the record finally came out in 90 after mm -hmm. all this. You know, the, the, the problem, the, the curse on our whole career was that, you know, we had all these huge names working with us. You know, we had Jimmy Iveen as our manager and John Kaladner as our A&R guy. Mm -hmm. And then we had Bob Rock as our producer. And we thought, oh, man, this is going to be great. But the problem is, is all these guys have huge egos. <laughs> sure. And they get to fight, man. And, you know, we're like the kid in the corner who's watching mom and dad beat the crap out of each other. And, <laughs> You know, at the, at the end of the day, it, it really didn't serve us very well. So, mm -hmm. right. why not work? <laughs> right. And, you know, even before your first CD came out, right, um, you guys had the EP out. Um, right. Which was produced by, uh, what was what was his name? Joe Hardy from, you know. Joe who, Hardy. Who ultimately went on to work with ZZ Top and was very well. Well, he, was, he worked he was already working with them, right. even before that. Yeah. Right. That's true. And he, you know, Joe is a great guy. He's rest in peace. He passed away a mm -hmm. year or so back. But Joe is just this great, funny guy who got the band. You know, the thing, the thing is, is we wanted to have the record, you know, because really that EP was just demos. We had done mm -hmm. with Joe over a few days going down to Memphis. Right. And we really liked it, but the label, you know, John Colladino wanted to make us a lot slicker sounding and more, you know, more produced. Mm -hmm. And I knew that wasn't a good idea to start with because when you have a bunch of guys that look like tattooed axe murdering bikers and not <laughs> yeah. slick record, people are going to go, well, how did this ballad come out of these dirt bags, you know? <laughs> so, you know, we thought Joe was one of the guys because he worked with ZZ Top and so many other great bands. And so it was great working with him and going down there. And, you know, the funny thing was is that the reason why we put that EP out is because we had committed to working with Bob Rock and then John Kaladner and Bob Rock, the producer, got into a fight over Blue Murder and they weren't talking to each other. So we had to wait a year to start our record. Okay. And we're just sitting around with our thumb up our butt going, what's going on? So mm -hmm. Geffen decided to put these songs out through Metal Blade, like okay. Guns N' Roses did with their EP. Okay, it yeah. All, it was all contrived, you know. Interesting, okay. Um, working with Metal Blade was great. Um, mm -hmm. 
Brian, Brian Slagle over at Metal Blade, man, he's such a great guy and is so mm -hmm. passionate about music mm -hmm. and does great things for his artists, you know. So we put that out and, you know, got some stuff started and released until we can get in and work with Bob. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that those are actually demo recordings that are on that EP? Yeah, those were just oh, me. Wow. Come down and we blasted down to Memphis, and mm -hmm. I think we did like three or four days down there. Mm -hmm. And um, it it was a fun time because Joe Joe is a character. He's a mm -hmm. real. Um, and in fact, I think if you look, you got I gotta pull up the the artwork, but it said produced by Joe Fuck Queen Hardy. <laughs> oh man, okay. And the way that came about was when we were in the studio, Joe went and bought some cheap porn magazines at a liquor store uh -huh. on the street <laughs> and threw them all around the studio. Mm -hmm. And one of them was about transsexuals, you know, okay. mm -hmm. she, she boys, you know. Right, right. And it was called Fuck Queen. So when we, <laughs> did, when we did the record and they asked Joe how he wanted his title, his credits to read, he said, Joe Fuck Queen Hardy. <laughs> the label got really freaked out about that. Sure, sure. And Jimmy Ivey, I remember him screaming on the phone, if that's how the guy wants to be called, you know, that's how the guy wants to be called. You know? sure. So Joe is a real character. He, sure. he got us the keys to the city and all this crazy stuff. And he was just, a, he was a great guy. Right, right, right. Very cool. So, so you were saying now you were waiting for Bob Rock for a year. He was working on the Blue Murder album. Yeah, he did. The, they got, got into a fight and Bob wound up, I think, booking the cult. Uh -huh. And then we had, to, we had to wait for that record to be done. And then we went up to Vancouver. And, you know, the problem with that is Bob said he wanted to make more of a, of a down-to-earth, simple, not many overdubs, not overproduced kind of record. He always wanted to do that kind of record. Mm -hmm. And we started that way. And then while we were up there, Dr. Feelgood, Motley Crue, went to number one. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we went from Bob making a Little Caesar record to Little Caesar making a Bob Rock record. Mm, so that first record wound up, we had a lot of fights over it, wound up being a lot slicker produced and a lot more overdubs, and a lot more reverbs and all this stuff than we really wanted to, you know, so. Interesting. And so, so yeah, so if you were going to redo that, then what, it sounds like you'd kind of take out some of those we layers. We strip it all down, man. It down, right. You know, like, we want guys like Tom Dowd and did like, Leonard Skinner and sure. Exasium, you know, did some stuff with Zeppelin or, you know, we wanted just a real 70s kind of sounding, bad company, Leonard Skinner, you know, Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. just that old school, really warm, really honest, really um, personal kind of record. Mm. And that's not what we wound up making, but you know, <laughs> I guess they were, you know, they wanted to compete with the other albums at the time. But sure yeah. enough, it caused all the problems I thought it was, you know, because right. here's this, you know, these nice ballads that he took all the edges off of, and mm -hmm. they looked at us and went, "Wait a minute, this band is doing this ballad?" And it's mm -hmm. like, "Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's <laughs> us." Right. Oh. You know, that's one of the things I remembered because I had seen you guys live first and, and we'll get into that a little later on. Right. But I, I was like 18,000 feet away from the stage. So I couldn't yeah. see what you guys looked like. But right. I went home and I bought the CD like that week and I turned it to the back. And I'm like, holy oh, shit. Oh, yeah. That, that doesn't <laughs> look like what I expected. You know, I'm used yeah. to seeing everybody look like, you know, Brett Michaels. Yeah. Hair and makeup and all that. Yeah. And yeah. guys with all tattoos all over the place. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, it was, it was pretty funny because we, we used to load in to do shows and you know, all these venues thought we were the road crew, you know? <laughs> sure. You know, we just got these greasy jeans on and, you know, and, you know, white beater shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when does the band get here? When we plug in and start playing, they're like, oh, you are the band. You are the band. Yeah, yeah, that's us. Oh, man. So, you know, we wore the same stuff on stage that we did off stage. There was mm -hmm. no glamorous anything going on with us. That's right. the way we wanted to be. It's just the guy you know, a blue collar, middle class working kind of band, you know? Mm -hmm. so. No, ab absolutely. So to me, so one of the interesting things about that debut CD is, you know, you have Chain of Fools on there and Aretha Franklin yeah. cover, you know, um, I Wish It Could Rain. Uh, whose idea yeah. was it to do those Temptations covers? Cover. Temptations yeah. cover, exactly. Yeah. So whose idea was it to do those covers? Well, that's actually, it's funny because uh, we didn't even want to put Chain of Fools on the record, let alone really? have to be the single. Mm -hmm. When we first put the band together, we just picked some cover tunes because I was like, listen, man, I, I want to do like a hard rock soul band. Mm -hmm. Something that's got a lot of Motown, a lot of vocals, a lot of soul, blues influence. So we just grabbed these cover tunes and said, 
how could we, you know, if, if Van Halen covered, you know, Sam Cooke, what would it mm-hmm. sound like, you know? Mm-hmm. So we, we picked like Wish It Would Rain and Chain of Fools and did our own thing and it just stuck with us, you mm-hmm. know? It's like, so that's how they wound up on the record. It was really just something, because we, you know, we wanted to get the chemistry right with the players of the band. So we just picked these songs and mm-hmm. rather than trying to write originals, which always, you know, can get a little tense and a little mm-hmm. frustrating. <laughs> sure. It's like, let's just, let's just do some cover tunes and see mm-hmm. what spin we can put on some of these songs, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, and to me, it definitely works on that album. Those songs fit and they fit right in with the hard rock songs, whether it's Hard Times, Rock and Roll, Say to Mind. It's yeah, just, it's all bluesy, just bluesy, just kind bluesy, of, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, that was just our paying tribute, you know, really wanting to wear our influences on our sleeves, you know. Yeah, yeah. and then I'll just give a shout out to you for 30 seconds here. So the Temptation song, Wish You Could Rain, right? Um, that high note, you know, that's in like the second verse, I Gotta Cry But Crying, it eases me. You nailed yeah. that to me. That's such a great, uh, great lyric, right. great vocal that you Bang. did there. So I want to give a shout out to that. Cool, thanks. Yeah. I, mean, I, love, I love singing that song. Yeah. It's so much fun. Yeah. So let me ask you, it sounds like then if you had your choice, though, you wouldn't have chose Chain of Fools as the first single? No, 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 no. no. What would you choose? Well, I, you know, I don't know. We, we, there was some songs that we left off the record. We didn't even record that I liked. Um, and, you know, hindsight's always pure sight. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I would have let off with, with, more, uh, with the original. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole the whole concept from John Collagno was like, well, you know, Van Halen broke with a cover tune. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Sure. Um, Areth- it's a, Aretha's song, is that's because it's Aretha. It's a great <laughs> thing the phone book. In a way. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the strongest rock track to go with. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, like Down and Dirty or Hard Times, something that really represented what the band was about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because even down and dirty, it's funny because we, we put out a, a a CD of demos and songs that never made it on record. And we put the demo of down and dirty on, which was, mm-hmm. um, we wrote that, I wrote that with Randy Bachman from Bachman Turner, or <laughs> Bachman Turner Overdrive. Yep. And we got so much crap from Kalab he didn't like the title. And I'm like, look at us, we're down <laughs> and dirty. That's, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so... You know, I would have picked a track like that and then, mm-hmm. you know, the usual follow it up with Wish It Would Rain or mm-hmm. In Your Arms or mm-hmm. one of those other more valid type tracks. Mm-hmm. But it, it was such a weird time because the, the quick synopsis on that is when we put out the record, three weeks after we put out the record, David Geffen sold the label to mm-hmm. this Japanese company called Matsuchira. Mm-hmm. And while our, while we're on MTV, while our records are in the stores, he sells the label and all of a sudden, Nothing from Geffen is getting into the stores anymore because mm-hmm. it went from Warner Brothers distributing it and in their warehouses to BMG. So here we are on the charts and nobody could find our record in the store. So it just oh, stalled, man. it just died while mm-hmm. I worked that out. Then a couple of weeks after that, Japanese company finds out that, and nobody knows this at the time, Geffen had like 280 acts that they had signed. You know, they knew Aerosmith and Nirvana right. and Nelson and all these other. And so they're like, they brought in this, this accountant guy this, to chop the budgets of everything. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden it just, and then a week after that, the label manager that was in charge of us and DGC records, which was us, Nelson and Nirvana, got fired for some indis- indiscreet behavior. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So all of this happened within like three, four weeks and everything just ground to a halt. So here we are all over radio, all over MTV, and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. the bottom just fell out on us and we never recovered from it, you know? Now, and you're saying that was during like 1990, I guess it sounds yeah, like? Yeah, this was, this was literally in like six weeks after the record came out, five weeks, four weeks, somewhere in there. All of this hit within like a two or three week period. And you couldn't get anyone on the phone, you know, the manager's been, fired a new, mm-hmm. new you know a new marketing guy that's cutting everybody's budget and then the final nail in the coffin was our manager Jimmy Ivey started up Interscope Records at that time mm-hmm. and David Geffen went to him and said listen I, I got this publishing company and I'd like you to distribute the product through Geffen and Jimmy told him no mm-hmm. so David got really mad and he took it out on us. And we got this letter basically saying that, well, since you guys reside in California, it's against the law 
for your manager to also have a record label. So you have a choice of either firing him mm -hmm. or he's got to stop his record label. And now Jimmy Iman's not going to quit his whole baby. Uh, so <laughs> right. we had a we had a we had a part ways with him. We did it amicably, but right, 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 that, right. that's the kind of nasty crap that goes on, you know. Oh, that's crazy. Now, yeah. now but then your second album didn't it also come out on Geffen or am it I came out on Geffen, but it was kind of a contractual fulfillment of ob, you know gotcha. obligation fulfillment mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and they they put nothing behind it, and it right. was interesting because. I mean, we're one of the few acts that they never re-released our records for like mm -hmm. 20 years. You couldn't get our record. Mm -hmm. Right. They would sell for like 150 bucks on eBay. I <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, but and that was all just a vendetta. And I remember the contract, the 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 first term of the contract I came due, we went down and met with David, David um Geffen and Eddie Rosenblatt, the president, mm -hmm. Jimmy Ivey was there, and I was there. And David just came right out and said, Listen, man, um, this didn't work out, you know, there's some tension personally. And, you know, and so uh, we're basically, you know, going to let you guys go, but I'm going to be pointed at me because I'm going to hold you to the key man clause in the contract because I can't have you guys go to Capital or Electra. Sure. And if you sell records, it makes my company look bad. I got to look mm -hmm. out for my, my label. Right, right, right. So basically he told me he was going to stick me on a shelf and he told me, I remember this quote. He goes, I collect artists like I collect my artwork. And if I want to Ooh, put wow. you up on the wall or put you on a shelf, maybe I'll take you down to admire you. Maybe I won't. He goes, mm -hmm. and if you don't believe me, ask Neil Young or Don Henley. You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Ouch. Oh, man. <laughs> Ouch. So I kind of knew it was over at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. Now, right around that time also is when Manic Edens happened for you, right? Yeah, that was a couple of years later. That was 94. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call. Um, Adrian Vandenberg got my phone number and he called mm -hmm. me, told me he was putting this project together and he wanted it to be like this progressive blues kind of thing. Sort of like a little bit of Cream, a little bit of Hendrix, mm -hmm. a little Stevie Ray Vaughan. Something he wanted to break the mold of the white snake thing, and it was mm -hmm. Adrian Vandenberg, Rudy Sarzo, and mm -hmm. Tommy Aldridge. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much the core of white snake with me. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, he originally they were going to use James Christian from um, from House of Lords, um, and that it, it just wasn't working out for them on that. So he called me, and I finished off writing melodies and lyrics for half the songs. The other the other half Adrian and I had written. And, went to a studio in Burbank and put it out. And again, that was another thing that we finished this record. It was done for JVC in Japan and Adrian retained the rights to it for the rest of the world. So he figured, okay, we'll get the record done and we'll go shop it around in the States and in Europe. And nobody would even meet with him to listen to it. Because remember, mm -hmm. at this point, it's grunge. Right. Oh, and if it didn't have, if it wasn't wrapped in flannel, you know, and dark, they didn't <laughs> yeah. want it. They wouldn't even listen to it. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in these meetings absolutely shocked. Like, do you know how many records these guys have sold? Agreed. agreed. They, I mean, they wouldn't listen to it. They wouldn't, didn't even ask how much we wanted for mm -hmm. it. They mm -hmm. just wouldn't even talk to us. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how short-sighted that was. Yeah. No, and no. so that fell apart kind of quick. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you look all through the, the 90s, I, I liked some of the grunge stuff, but I stayed in touch with all the 80s music. I, I still loved it all. And I yeah. hate to admit this, it was 10 years until I knew about that album coming out. And, uh, and, I, yeah, was no, fan, and I was a Little Caesar fan, and I had no clue at that time that that yeah, album Yeah, no, it was out. just one of those little things. It never saw the light of day. It did really well in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it almost went gold. And wow. We never, you know, we went over and did one promotional tour for it. We did a quick acoustic promotional tour over in, in France. And that was it. It was, you know, those guys, you know, at this point, they're functional adults and they had bills to pay and families mm -hmm. and sure. they couldn't just sit around waiting for a record deal. So they went back to doing white state stuff and all the studio stuff and Absolutely. Just never, it never came to be. Absolutely. So going back to the debut Little Caesar album, right before you mentioned in the uh, songwriting. So I used to love sitting with the records or CDs and reading all the notes, right? That, that was my thing. Listen to the album. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's like reading the cereal box. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I loved it. So, but one of the things I always remembered from it is that I was looking at the songwriting. Of course, you had the two covers. All the songs pretty much looked like they were written by mostly you and the band members, except for In Your Arms. Looked like it was you and, and I think it was, it was Greg Simon. written by Greg. I wrote uh, on that record, outside of the covers, mm -hmm. um, and Cajun Panther, which Lauren wrote. 
Mm -hmm. um, I wrote all the melodies and lyrics, but I wrote Greg's um, In Your Arms with a, a buddy, Greg Sutton, mm -hmm. who was in a band at the time called um, Lone Justice. He was working with Jimmy Ivey. So Jimmy just was, Jimmy had me write with like Billy Squire, and he had me write with, uh, with Tom Bell from the Stylistics. He had me write with uh, Steve Cropper. Mm -hmm. from you know from all the stacks volts days and so i wrote that song with greg and it took us like a half an hour we just wrote that song it just came out of us it was great no it's, it's a great great song so yeah. it, to me it's hard to believe that album is now 30 years old does it feel like 30 years to you uh yeah according to my back <laughs> yes <laughs> okay no, other than you. that no it's kind of shocking to me Good. it really is where the time goes Right. Now, to me, I was excited. I saw online a few weeks ago, because I love that debut album, that you guys are going to do something that I think is the first time you're doing in your career, right? You're going to play that album front to back, right? So yeah. First, that. Yes. Coming up December 26th, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be on, because we are being sponsored, hosted by Black Star Amps mm -hmm. and BraveWords.com. And on our Little Caesar page, concurrently, we're going to do um, a live in the studio, uh, perform the whole record in its entirety. Mm -hmm. So we've never done that, number one. Number two, some of these songs we haven't played for 29 years. Mm -hmm. so never wound up doing live for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so we've been in trying to kick all the rust off because <laughs> it's a pandemic. We haven't, mm -hmm. been doing, we haven't been getting together. Mm -hmm. So we've been feverishly preparing for that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to get everybody's schedules to line up and you know, between the COVID scares and everything else, we sure. had to take a week off because someone was near someone that got it, mm. and had to be responsible, you know, mm. all that kind of stuff. Right. So, okay. but it's it's going to happen. So, okay. we're really looking so December 26th at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. And if you're watching in Europe, it's 8 p.m. UK and 9 mm -hmm. p.m. in Europe. So. And, and is this on the Little Caesar Facebook page? Yes, yeah, so it'll be on the Little Caesar Facebook page, the Brave Words Facebook page on dot com, mm -hmm. and Black Stars Facebook page. But please, if, if anybody's interested, come check us out, Little Caesar. Mm -hmm. You'll have to fish through like 10 pizza chain websites. <laughs> You'll find us. Right, You'll find right, right, right. Absolutely. Um, Little Caesar Band. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll, it'll be live on that. Yeah. So, on, so let, uh, let me turn us the yeah, let me divert us for 30 seconds. Where'd the band name come from? Right? So you just mentioned well, the See, this is another classic record company screw up. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I got I came up with the name, I took it from the old 30s gangster film with Edward G. Robinson called okay. Little Caesar. Mm -hmm. And it was just an old favorite movie. It was just, you know, so I always thought the Caesar is big and powerful, but the little brings us down to earth because we don't okay. Do not take ourselves seriously. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, we're a cartoon, so. Mm -hmm. um, and Geffen never let us know. We didn't know there was a national pizza chain with that name. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're in California working our butt off. Didn't mm -hmm. even know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we did all the artwork, and we're in a meeting, and Geffen's like, yeah, well, you know, uh, just, just so you know, the lawyer speaks up says, you know, since it's music and not food related, we're fine on the pizza chain. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, there's, you know, there's a national pizza chain with the name. I'm like, no, I didn't know this. We changed the band name to Domino's. I mean, come on. Just let oh, well, it's too late to change it now. And we're like, oh, my God. Oh, man. So we didn't even know. Oh, okay. God, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's so hilarious. We, Mind of picking the name of a national pizza chain for a rock and roll band. You know? <laughs> well, I guess it could have been worse, right? It could have been Domino's or Pizza Hut or yeah, something. Oh yeah, it could it, it could certainly be worse. But, right. But pretty much, we wound up laughing about it. Going, man, oh, only only in this town and only on this label could right. they not let us know that you know it's like picking Dunkin' Donuts. For right. You. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh yeah, I think we would pick another name if we right. do. You know? that, that's hilarious. So going yeah. back to the streaming thing, right? Oh, and think, actually, one quick thing. Yeah, yeah, please. To this day, mm -hmm. at least once or twice a month, I get an email 
Oh no. <laughs> on, on our website or on our little season page, people complaining about their pizza. Oh no. <laughs> you know, it was supposed to be loaded with sausage and it wasn't. You guys suck. So I like, well, thank you. I'm sorry for your experience. But, uh, you yeah, buy our CD. Back, yeah. <laughs> buy our CD. I mean, it's unbelievable, people. Uh, it's well, like, well, well, I'll say the band Little Caesar for me is better than the pizza Little Caesar for whatever that's worth. Oh my God, that's not pizza. <laughs> yeah, I agree. From New I'm, York, I agree. You know, we're, yeah, we're, we're East Coast, man. We know what pizza tastes like. Absolutely. It ain't that crap. It ain't <laughs> that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, just going back to the streaming thing, right? I think that you're also, I, I'll say, partnering with the, where people could donate money to uh, save our stages. Yes, and that's right? another thing. It's, um, we've been trying to do everything we can. We, we did a Monsters of Rock, because we're on the Monsters of Rock mm -hmm. tour, which is actually now on the boat this year. It'll be down in the Dominican Republic, yep. another great event we're doing in May. We did that live stream for their website, and all the money went to Music Cares, because mm -hmm. a lot of musicians are having trouble with substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And this time, everything's being donated to Save Our Stages, which is um, the National Independent Venue Association, NEVA, Save Our Stages. Mm -hmm. and they're trying to collect money to help keep these venues afloat because man they're all starving and they're going out absolutely. of business and absolutely without these these clubs and theaters and stuff there'll be nowhere to go hear live music anymore mm -hmm. so it's really important to help help keep them alive i mean i, I do a lot of work but these these venues man they're shut they're shut there's nothing else they can do absolutely so all so we're asking folks to donate whatever you can a dollar whatever you can to, mm -hmm. to help, you know, keep these people's lights on or their, their leases going. And mm -hmm. As soon as this vaccine gets through and things start opening up, people can start going back out and enjoying the thrill of live music again, the uh, magic, you know. From, from your lips to God's ears. And you know, that's yeah, yeah. it's coming. Yeah, absolutely. It's it is. a rough year, man. Whew, rough it year. It has been. Now, you guys yeah. did do some shows earlier in the year, though, right? Um, Yeah, we did a couple of shows early in the year. And the thing is, is like, we decided this year, you know what, man, we should really put some more energy and get out there. And I had mm -hmm. like about 10 weekend runs throughout the United States. We were going to go to Philly and Pennsylvania and Philly and Pittsburgh and mm -hmm. New York and Connecticut. And I, I had booked all these weekend runs mm -hmm. and they all went out the window. And a lot of those venues, man, they're closed now permanently. Yeah. And, um, and then every year we go over to either, sometimes we do both. We go, we do a UK Scandinavia, Europe run. Um, that's kind of what we've been doing mostly for like the last mm -hmm. nine, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that for another month in September. So everything, we had a whole bunch of festivals booked for 2020 and it all just got transposed to 2021. So right. we're hoping by September of 2021, we're going to be back to, to live music again. So Absolutely. yeah, Absolutely. so we'll jump back on that horse. So. Absolutely. No, that's very cool. So to me, one of the things I'm looking forward to with the stream and show is, you know, I love the debut album. There's not a weak song on it. And you were saying before, it's always like Little Queenie, Midtown. Yeah. I, I don't recall ever seeing that you guys actually played those songs live before. No, yeah. never played, never once. Did you ever do Little Queen? I didn't think so. Um, you know, and so we, we had to work that up, especially with the outro. Mm -hmm. Because that outro was just kind of this, you know, we wanted to go out on the beat. So, okay, that's going to be the last song on the record. We want to do this kind of breakdown, slow, gospel y kind of thing with this mm -hmm. background singer. Fortunately, Pharaoh, our bass player, he, he can cover those high notes okay. that, that, that Chick was singing on. That we uh -huh. uh -huh. And so, we never did that live. So, we're looking forward to that. And, you know, Midtown, we haven't done it for like 28 years. So, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it's been a while. And it's, it's been great. Mm -hmm. you know knocking the dust off of those songs and, and relearning them and um they're a lot of fun to play you know absolutely now you think if this goes well and it's well received could you ever see you doing this like hopefully if we get back to touring in 2021 can you see you taking that on the road we've talked about that because a lot of people you know since the first record was the one that got the most you know light of day shined on it mm -hmm. and that's how a lot of people found the band um you know out touring with kiss and this other stuff that we did in that early days of our career mm -hmm. um it's been a really great response to it so we've been talking about maybe we'll do that mm. cool. and we might do it with even the first the, the second record as well we might do a streaming event with the second record mm -hmm. and we might build a little like 
wheel that you spin and you can <laughs> okay. see when comes up. Uh -huh. <laughs> and each you play one, you pull the name off, you know. Oh, I think Elvis good. Costello did that. And okay. It, uh -huh. it was a lot of fun. So right, right, right. Yeah, it was crazy shit we talk about. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Very cool. So yeah. you just mentioned the the Kiss tour in 1990, the Hot in the Shade tour. So that's how I found out about the band. I'm a huge Kiss fan. I went to see it was you, Slaughter and Kiss. And um, I didn't know who this band Little Caesar was, but I left um, the first time I saw you was at the Meadowlands. I left yeah. the Meadowlands and I'm like, I'm a fan. And I saw you guys, I think two nights later at the Nassau Coliseum. So ah. how, how did you guys get onto that 12 with Kiss? Well, uh, Gene Simmons was friends with Jimmy Ivey. And what yeah. happened was, was Winger was originally, it was Winger, Slaughter and Kiss. Yeah. And really Winger and Slaughter were the draws on the tour. <laughs> you know, they were the ones that were all over MTV. And Absolutely. It was an older crowd coming to see Kiss, but the real passionate fans. So when Winger dropped off the tour, ticket sales went in the toilet for mm -hmm. that tour. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't find, so Jimmy spoke to Gene, said, I don't want to get my band on that tour. So they stuck us on the tour. Mm -hmm. And because Winger had to go back in and the, their label didn't think they had a strong lead off single. So they sent them back to the studio. So they went mm -hmm. off and I guess they had a song and they knocked it out really quick, like a week later. And okay. so they were like, well, we'd like to get back on the tour. Well, they committed to us being on there for six weeks, but mm -hmm. Gene did everything he could to get us kicked off that tour. It was funny. Really? Cause, yeah, because- Any, they, any stories you could share? Little inside stories. Yeah, go ahead. Gene and Paul used to, if ticket sales were really bad, you know, mm -hmm. say like only like 8,000 seats for like 18,000, they would cancel the show. Mm -hmm. And what they would do, remember, this is before the internet. Sure. So this is local media and newspapers. Mm -hmm. They would claim that like Paul got into a car accident. Mm -hmm. He's okay. Mm -hmm. He's fine. A couple mm -hmm. of days will be back and running. Mm -hmm. And they cancel the date because they didn't want to lose the money. Mm -hmm. So hysterically, it was funny because we had a couple of days off. We were up in like Rhode Island or something. And we pull in with the bus underneath the, you know, in the arena and, we get off the bus, the bus pulls away, and then the limo pulls in, and there's Gene, we're saying, hi, how you been? Then another limo pulls in, and Paul gets out, and he opens the door, and he looks at Gene, and he's like, Whoo! and like walks past him in a huff, and Gene's like, what, what? Mm -hmm. So Paul goes, I'm in a car accident? You don't call? You don't send me flowers? <laughs> I'm in the hospital for the night? And mm -hmm. Gene's like, I didn't know I thought it was just another one of those you canceled one of the dates. I didn't oh, know it was an actual car because no, this time I was actually in the car. <laughs> and it was hysterical. Oh, anyway, so Gene wanted us off the tour to get Winger back out and he called Jimmy Ivey up. One of the best lines I've ever heard in rock and roll. And again, this is before the internet. So mm -hmm. there wasn't any, no buzz getting back to the label about how we were doing. Mm -hmm. And he calls up, he's like, ah, oh, Jimmy, I got to get your boys off the tour. They're going over like pork chops at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's hilarious. So next thing you know, Jimmy's like, listen, I want to, every day, I want to see newspapers from every town the mm -hmm. day after that show. And every one of the reviews was great. Mm -hmm. We were great, you know, original, honest rock and roll band. We put mm -hmm. on a great show, keep an eye on these guys. So Gene was like, okay, well, maybe they're, going over pretty good but mm -hmm. you know it was funny but you just all those politics back in the day you know mm -hmm. and gene simmons is just a living you know he's a living legend in a cartoon mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so. absolutely. But, absolutely yeah do you so think we maybe, were out with him for six weeks yeah right right do you think it was a, a good parent for little caesar with slaughter and kiss um, I, listen at the time i mean that's the thing that was so weird for us here we are, like this straight ahead rock and roll band, like the Stones, a bad company, ACDC, Skinner, ZZ Top, and all the other bands were these pop metal bands. Right. So we're more of a classic rock band. And I remember we did a tour once with Jane's Addiction. Mm -hmm. That did not go well. No, that doesn't seem like a good thing. No, and like art rock. And uh -huh. then, 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 then come the bikers and the kids mm -hmm. were like, huh? What's this? You know? right, right, right. Um, but no, you know, everybody that, that tour on that tour, they were just rock fans mm -hmm. and they were really welcoming and warm. I mean, the weird thing is I'd say about 30, 40% of the nights, the tickets would say 
Band start at eight o'clock and Gene would stick us on at seven thirty. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yeah. So like people were just like the arena people were just starting to show up, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, that's just all those little tricks, you know. Mm -hmm. Gene would do that he'd only give you, you know, a third of the lights and a third of the PA, yeah. you know. The classic headliner stuff. You know, yeah, got yeah, one yeah. sound check the whole tour, you know. Oh boy. Okay. So, you know. But it's just day, man. It's just life in the trenches, you know? Absolutely. Now, again, like I said before, I love to read all the liner notes. And I know on your second album, Rum and Coke, Gary Court plays keyboards. Did yes, Gary's him? a good buddy. Did, did you meet him on the Kiss tour? Is that where that came from? Yes, out? that's what Gary was the, he's more good stories. Gary was the <laughs> backstage keyboardist. Yep. And what he would do is he was in a little, like, screened off area on the side of the stage. And he would double all of Paul's rhythm parts mm -hmm. on the guitar because Paul would be running around so much and they didn't want any dropouts. So right. Gary had a guitar patch and would just pay, and then he would, Gary would trigger the background vocals. Mm -hmm. Even back then yep. on, a, on a machine, he, all the lick it up, all the mm -hmm. perfect, a little bit out of tune so it sounded good. <laughs> right. They were using, and Gene used to come out and he, during their sound check, he would never say, I need more vocal samples. Mm -hmm. He would say, I need more keyboard. Mm. And the monitor guy would turn up Gary's keyboards, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Gene would get all angry. And uh -huh. fact, it was a really funny story. They, they had a monitor engineer. He was only out for a couple of days. And mm -hmm. it was like right when we started on the tour. And every day, the guy had like one of these NASCAR kind of jackets on, red with all the patches, and a NASCAR hat. Mm -hmm. And it's like he wore it every day, like six, seven days in a row. Mm -hmm. And she was yelling at him and yelling at him. And finally one night, like we go about these like turn up the keyboard things. Mm -hmm. Gene ran over to the side of the stage and yelled and screamed at him. You know, the show was over. I was like, wow, man, Gene got really mad at the monitor engineer tonight. Yeah, yeah. Well, it turned out that the monitor engineer knew that Gene was going to yell at him. And he had no patience for it. Mm -hmm. So what he did was he got a, some na the cardboard cutout from like AutoZone of a NASCAR mm -hmm. driver. Mm -hmm. And he put... In the middle of the show, he put the cardboard cutout of the guy behind the monitor board <laughs> and went to the airport and quit. <laughs> so there's the guy like this. There's the, the AutoZone thing. And he <laughs> thinks the guy's going, yeah, yeah, got you covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wound up sending somebody out to the airport to get him and he apologized. But he had this whole perfect thing worked out with this NASCAR cardboard cutout of oh, when he was going to, he was going to screw Gene and walk out on him. <laughs> That's hilarious. Great. So yeah, got to meet Gary Corbett, who was still a, a good friend. I just saw him a, a, a while ago nice. uh, in Nashville. I went and saw him. Mm -hmm. And we keep talking about trying to do some stuff together. We wound up, me and Gary wound up demoing a whole bunch of songs together back in oh, okay. 94, 93. Mm -hmm. We were trying to put something together, but he was on the East Coast and I was out here. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. no. but yeah, great guy. He played with Cinderella and yep. he was played with so many great producer, great producer and writer. Yeah. 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 No, I did a chat with him maybe four or five months ago. A super nice yeah. guy. And like super said, nice guy. Resume. Great resume. Super nice guy. Now, yeah, for we, yourself, for yourself, right? So you're saying you only did like six weeks with Kiss. You grew up in New York. You had to be excited at least to get some of those New York local. Like, like I said, I saw you guys at the NASA Coliseum, the Metal. Oh yeah, yeah, man. I was mean, like that for you. Here's, here's where I would go to drool over Alice Cooper, and right. Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. and my brother used to take me see Zeppelin when I was a really young nice. kid, you mm -hmm. know. And so to play with Kiss, now I was never a big Kiss fan. Mm -hmm. See, I'm in that age period age bracket where younger kids like kids yep you know I, i'm in that age bracket where oh no man that's for kids <laughs> no, I'm, mm -hmm. you know real rock band is sabbath and zeppelin man you know? totally got that yep and you know so uh, respecting them it just wasn't a huge fan but right. it's like i'm getting to go to play in front of the on the stage of the nassau coffee and, and the metal Lands. man this mm -hmm. is just a dream come true for me, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I, anything else I did from there on out, <laughs> I've done, I picked the right thing to do. If I can mm -hmm. make it to that stage, I didn't pick the wrong, the wrong path in life. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It was such an honor. And, you know, that's Gene and Paul stomping grounds too. So Great. Yeah. they, they, you know, they were really warm and happy and in a great mood seeing all their friends and all their mm -hmm. family out there at those shows. It was a lot of fun. I tell you, we get more people that, you know, we didn't realize it at the time, but 
Like we go back on the East Coast and go to any of those cities and there were so many people there that say, yeah. oh, I saw you in Harrisburg with Kiss and yeah. I've been a fan ever since. And it's just like, wow, man, that's the way it used to work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Now you were talking before about the image of the band, right, Little Caesar. Do you think that coming with a lack out, of image. Oh, with a lack of image, right, <laughs> exactly. Right? With the whole tattoos and the biker look, right? Do you think coming out in the late 80s during that whole hair metal scene, do you think that actually hurt the band? Do you oh, think yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't, like I said, it was really not our look. It was the way we produced the record to mm -hmm. amuse people. Mm -hmm. If we would have made a record that sounded... Now, one of the other things I kept telling record company guys was, listen, you can't just keep putting out this fluffy metal stuff, this mm -hmm. pop metal stuff. That's it's getting old. Every band, they do the rock track and then the ballad. They all look alike. They all sound alike. Kids want an alternative. Mm -hmm. and sure enough, that's when alternative. <laughs> sure. Everything from Blues Traveler to Chili Peppers to mm -hmm. Nirvana. Yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and in fact, I remember when we signed, when we, when we moved over from Geffen to VGC, the subsidiary, mm -hmm. the point of it was to break new bands. And the only three bands was us, Nelson, and they go, and we have this other college indie band. <laughs> They'll probably sell only 30,000 records, but we really like them. A the mm -hmm. band called Nirvana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, they, they gave me the CD, and I'm like, 30,000? I think you guys are underselling these guys. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to do way better. And sure enough, they did. Right. <laughs> of course. Right. But, so we, our attitude is, listen, this has got to change. And we want, we want to be a roots-based rock band where it's okay to look like a bunch of dirt bags and not like a bunch of, you know, strippers, you right, know? Right, right, mm -hmm. And if we were to made a record like Raging Slab or, mm -hmm. you know, Junkyard Got to Make or even the first Soundgarden kind of record, mm -hmm. you know, because I remember when we did the second record, you know, the Soundgarden record came out. I'm like, see, look, first of all, the guy, look, he's got a goatee. Remember, mm -hmm. he, <laughs> he asked me to shave off my goatee. <laughs> We were the first band to have one. You right, know? right, right, right. And then even Gene used to yell at me to shave it off. And then mm -hmm. six weeks later, he's got a goatee, you know, in the night. Right, exactly. Right. So, you know, we're like, listen, man, we're wearing jeans, we ride motorcycles. What's more rock and roll than jeans and fucking Harleys? I right. mean, but when we made a record that was really kind of slick, mm -hmm. it there was a disjointment between the look and the sound mm -hmm. of the band. Because mm -hmm. if we would have made like a Black Sabbath y sounded record, you could you could still do all those ballads, but just sure. smaller and more honest and more mm -hmm. personal. We wanted to leave all that personality yeah. the way Bad Company records had or the mm -hmm. Stones records had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't let us do it, you know. Right. And sure enough, we were right. It kind of bit us in the butt. Because mm -hmm. when that all came out, they said, well, can you shave? Can you put on nicer clothes? Because people are looking at it and they don't see, they don't understand how a band can look like this, yet yeah. sound like this. We tried it for like a month. It was okay. like, yeah, this is, we, I, I have some photos oh, with yeah. clean shaving and a uh -huh. fluffy pink polka dotted shirt. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't pink. It was black yeah. Yeah, but, and white. Yeah. But I was like, oh, my God, look at us. Oh, man. <laughs> now, now, do I remember this right? Because back then I was also a huge Arsenio Hall fan. Were you guys on the Arsenio Hall show? Yes. I thought so, right? I thought we so. had gotten a phone call. Someone canceled. And we were out on with the Kiss tour. Okay. And we jumped on a plane, came back to L.A. And I remember that because we, we rushed down to the studio. First thing they asked us to do, Kachina Fools was out. Mm -hmm. Can you guys make it a little shorter? because we don't have enough time. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. we can cut the guitar solo out or something, and mm -hmm. we'll figure it out, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So during the sound check, when they're getting all the camera angles and everything, mm -hmm. I'm wearing a leather jacket and a, and a you know, tank top. Okay. And when we go to do the show, the guys are like, dude, you always perform with all your tattoos showing, mm -hmm. you know? Just go out there without a shirt on. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Curtain opens up, and I remember our manager was, was in the control booth, and the director's like, Oh my God, he's got my clothes on. Oh my God, <laughs> tattoos. What? This is. But they, they let us do it, and then we didn't shorten the song. We kept playing. We, okay. And they got really mad. Arsenio Hall was really mad at us. Was he really? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was pissed because we, we, we disrespected him. We didn't okay. do what we said we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
whatever. <laughs> Rock and roll, man. Yeah, yeah. Right. We did that. We did the Rick D show too. That's right. Yes, I remember that yeah. show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, how did you end up getting, I say, connected with Terminator 2, right? You had a part in that. Yes, I had. I, I was the guy that Arnold Schwarzenegger throws through the window in the beginning okay. of the movie. Uh -huh. He says, yeah. I want your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Uh -huh. And the way that came about was, for a long time, I was friends with the director, Catherine Bigelow. She did Hurt Locker. And so I've known Catherine from New York since the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And Catherine married Jim. They were, they were married for a while. And so I became friends with Jim. And he just heard that we were back off the road. And he just called me up. He goes, listen, man, come down. Hang out at the set. We can hang out. It's, it's fun. You can see mm -hmm. what we're doing. So it was shot in LA and it was actually the night of the Rodney King beating because we mm -hmm. saw the cars, all the cop cars flying by. Mm -hmm. We shot it at this little cowboy bar called the Corral. Mm -hmm. And Jim goes, listen, man, I got this part for you. You're going to hit a lot of shorts in the head with a pool cue. It's going to be great. <laughs> He's going to throw you through a window. It'll be a stunt guy. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, it, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Uh -huh. And... I got to hit him like 13 times <laughs> with, a, with a fake pool kid. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So I got, I got in the film, you know? And it, who knew that it was going to be one of the most iconic scenes in the movie? Right, right, absolutely. So yeah, if you could do movies fun. again, would you? Um, yeah, you know, I've done some, I mean, I'm not an actor, by right? Right. Mm -hmm. but um, no, it was funny because of Catherine, like there was a, she did uh, that movie Point Break, and mm -hmm. Anthony Kiedis from the Chili Peppers was in. I was supposed to be that guy, but we were okay. on floor. Mm -hmm. um, her shooting schedule got moved. And then I did some voiceover stuff for her um, um, in one of her other films, that movie with Ray Fiennes and Angela Bassett, I forget the name of that one. Okay. Um, so I did, a, you know, it's Hollywood. Everybody's been in a movie or something. <laughs> right, right, right. Living in this town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if you could go back in time, right? So we said you, you toured with Jane's Addiction, Kiss. I, I personally think two parents, that wasn't best for your band. If you no. go back in time, who would you want to tour with during that late 80s, early 90s? Oh, man. Of course, ACDC, just yeah. as a fan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bad Company, mm -hmm. ACDC. We did, uh, we did a couple of shows with uh, George Thorogood, which went okay. over really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we did some shows with Brian Adams when we were doing the record up in Vancouver. I got to actually sing a, a duet with him. Oh, really? In front of like 25,000 people. We did Stand By Me. Okay. The old Benny King song. Yep. Mm -hmm. laugh. Nice. He, he's a great singer. He is. Um, I like him. Mm -hmm. so another, weird another weird parent to me. Another weird parent. Another weird parent to me. Little yeah, yeah. Well, that was because we were working with Bob Rock, and he was working with Bob Rock, okay. and we were in Vancouver, and it's like, yeah, come on down and open up the show. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a, a little bit of an odd parent, to yeah. say the least. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of so many kinds of music, though, so it's... Likewise. Um, but, yeah, any straight ahead, you know, we did some shows with Leonard Skinner in the mm -hmm. early 90s. Mm -hmm. That was great. It was us and Junkyard and Lennox and Junkyard buddies of ours on Catherine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so any straight ahead blues based rock band, we'd go over farmers, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's like... phone call, sorry. No, no, not a problem. Not a my problem. wife. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I think to me, one of the cool things that maybe fans, some fans don't realize, especially if they only knew that first album, you guys are still out touring, putting out new albums. I think you have a new yeah. album a couple of years ago as well, right? So. Yeah, we did. I mean, you know, when the whole thing crashed and burned in like 92 with Geffen, mm -hmm. we took like seven or eight years off. That's when I did the Manic Eden Project. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be the first singer on Slashes on Snake Pit's record. But oh, that really? Yeah, yeah okay. he decided to go with a guy like more like Axel, singing more mm -hmm. like Axel, because mm -hmm. he knew that he would be doing GNR tunes every night. Mm -hmm. um, and so we took like six, seven years off and licked our wounds. And then we just started mm -hmm. getting together. And like 2010, we, we decided to do another record. We've done four records since, and we do it all under our own power, and which mm -hmm. is the way to do it. It's a labor of love and a spiritual journey, not one of commerce anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the funny thing is, is we make more money <laughs> putting out our own label, you know, our own records on our own little, mm -hmm you know, way 
mm -hmm. than a label would have ever been, you know, and it just keeps, it keeps buying the airline tickets and the hotel rooms so <laughs> we could get out and sell t-shirts and collect the door and, and these clubs and mm -hmm. we're, we're just blessed and lucky to be able to do it and uh, it, it's a, it's so much fun. And, you know, we come out every night and just go out to the merch table and take pictures and share mm -hmm. stories. And we've made so many great friends. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, we have a very small but loyal fan base. And, mm -hmm. and we get great uh, critical reviews of the records and all mm -hmm. these magazines. But uh, we just don't have the promotional engine behind us that right. Geffen was. And, right. um, but whatever, man. It's, it's a whole the music business, especially now. But mm -hmm. even before the pandemic is completely changed with mm -hmm. streaming and you know it, it's just a different world and it's still evolving every day so absolutely absolutely and what people may not realize it's actually you and two of the guys so three of you are from back in 1990 yeah yeah still right? three original members and of the original five one of them left right after the first record right. mm -hmm. so and we had earl slick playing with us and we've gone through so like Spinal Tap, they keep blowing up. This one has been around for a bunch of years now, mm -hmm. so that's good. But um, yeah, so we always had one rotating guitar player and then um, bass player wound up starting his own business a few years ago, okay. uh, four, four years ago. And so we replaced him with a guy because I sang for the Four Horsemen for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, did a tour of Canada with them and that's where I met Pharaoh because he was mm -hmm. um, in the later incarnation of the, of the Four Horsemen. So mm -hmm. try yep. that out. Absolutely. Do you think there'll be any new music on the horizon for the band? Uh, it could be. We're just trying to get back to playing live, you know, mm -hmm. for us, sure. you know, to, to zip in and make a record. And nowadays, I mean, think about it. how many people really, if you're a Bon Jovi fan, do you really know all the songs on this new record? Do you really know <laughs> the songs on the Metallica? You don't. Nice. You, you go back to the music that you remember as the, the soundtrack of your life from 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Absolutely. So we don't put a lot of energy in, you know, we get the itch and we have some new songs and we'll go in. So every couple of years we want to put down a new record, but mm -hmm. it's really about getting on the road, man, getting in front of people. That magic that happens in a room with a crowd, it's different every night. If you're not there that night, you've missed something that's special just in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that magic is so powerful and addictive to us. We just love it. Absolutely. So, you know, kind of closing on. So you're going to do the stream on December 26th, right? Yep. You already did one for the Monsters of Rock thing. How right. different is doing a concert like that streaming for you compared to like you were just saying out in front of a crowd? Oh, it's weird. It's weird <laughs> because it's very self-conscious because it's just like there's cameras in the room. So you just uh -huh. point this way and you're in a tiny room. You can't even move around. Mm -hmm. And the Monsters of Rock thing is a little bit bigger. But again, there's like eight people in the room because that's not... To me, music is the interaction between the audience and the energy they give us and the energy we give them, and it changes the whole dynamic, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's the magic of music. Agreed. And you, know, you listen to a record, that's one moment in time. Mm -hmm. But every night, subtle tempo changes and passion changes and the crowd response mm -hmm. completely makes every song different every night. Agreed. And so doing it in this new normal, so to speak, <laughs> mm -hmm. is really weird, man. It's just, it it's like really self-conscious. Yeah. It's kind of made me realize I could never be a porn star, you know? It's, <laughs> not, it's just not something that's meant to be sort of, you know, a lot more exciting and a lot less sterile, you know? No, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. As a fan, I actually went to a driving concert three weeks ago. I saw the band Kiss. Yeah. Well, How was that? Yeah, yeah, Kiss. Yes, yeah, so well, Brian Forsyth. That's right. Yes, exactly. Brian's a sweetheart, man. He's a great guy. Absolutely. Great guitar player too. Absolutely, yeah. and I think they're gonna be on the Monsters of Rock with you guys. But yeah, it, yeah. It was so weird. Like you're sitting. I sat outside my car, right on the hood. All right. But when you're watching the band, it seemed normal because you're getting that, right. you know. But then right. the song ends, and most people were in their car. You hear cars honking. Right. 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 I said, people clear, and I'm like, man, this, this is weird. weird. <laughs> this is weird. Just not right, man. Mm -hmm. it's just Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But I can tell you December 26th, I'm going to be watching on TV oh, thanks, stream. Man. And, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of fans that are going to be excited about that. And uh, I hope it's successful for you guys. Thanks, man. We're really looking forward to it. Thanks for your support. And, and you know, please, if you folks are watching, you know, go to our Facebook page, give us a like, you know, that always helps us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of some, I know some bands that have bought a lot of their fans. You just <laughs> download an app and you get 50,000 mm -hmm. fans. They're not real fans. 
Absolutely. Our fans are on our page. We interact. We care about you. You know, we become friends with them. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you know, check us out, give us a like on Facebook and watch the show on the 26th. And if you can donate anything to these Absolutely. venues, we, we really, really appreciate it. So thanks. Absolutely. You know, like you said, you know, whether it's the venues, the people working there, they all need our support. So yeah, whatever man. you could save our, yeah. save our stages, donate, watch on December 26th. Ron, thank you so much. I'm really looking thank forward to Thank you, Mike. Really nice thank talking you. to you. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Ron. Right. Stay safe. And I look forward to the 26th. You too, man. Be well. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Take care. All righty. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Ron as much as I did. Thanks a lot, Ron, for spending nearly an hour with me talking all about Little Caesar. That was a lot of fun. For all the Little Caesar fans out there, make sure you check out their live stream, December 22nd. I think that's going to be a great one, and we're all going to really enjoy it. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, the Rock and Roll Experience with Mike Brun, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time.